The importance of Magna Carta is very clear. It established the principle of due process of law, freedom under the law. We ask where that began. It began at Runnymede on the 15th of June, 1215. The point is it placed the king under the law and for the king then we can read executive authority today. The people who wronged us were brought under the law. The same wrongs, the same laws that apply to us applied to the wronger. Only four clauses of the original 1215 Magna Carta survive on the statute book today, so I suppose you could say not very much relevance. But I think two points. First of all, the clauses that survive on the statute book today are the important ones, the ones that affirmed universal principles. Clause 39, which laid down the principle of due process of law, and Clause 40, which said to no one shall we say or deny right or justice. They are still on the statute book, and their message is universal. But I think the second point that needs to be made is that the importance of Magna Carta in the long term is symbolic. It transcended its origins. It's more than the sum of its individual parts. It's what it means for us. It set a standard, and that standard is one against which we can judge the governments of any age in any place. The crisis concerned King John, who was, I think, every bit as bad as his historical reputation would suggest. There were two main problems. The first was external defeat. Throughout history, if a ruler has suffered defeat abroad, defeat on a massive scale, he lives with the consequences and there's a crisis at home. And broadly, that's one story behind the Magna Carta. In 1204, King John had lost Normandy, which had been united with England since the Norman Conquest. That discredited him. He levied very heavy taxes to try and recover it, and he failed. But the tax bill still had to be paid. So in origin, Magna Carta, the crisis that led to Magna Carta, began as a sort of tax revolt in the north of England and in East Anglia, and then it spread. Second thing is King John himself. He was a slippery character. Nobody liked him. Nobody trusted him. You wouldn't trust him any further than you could throw him. So by the beginning of 1215, England was in a state of civil war. Disaffection was spreading. In May, London went over to the rebels, and who controlled London then was as crucial as who controls London today or in any other period of English history. The barons had got control of London, and above all, the Londoners were prepared to bankroll them. So they were in business. How did the meeting come to happen at Runnymede? Quite simply, the barons were advancing west, out of London, along the old Roman road, to the crossing point of the Thames at Staines. King John had come up from Odium in Hampshire to Windsor. So the king was at Windsor, the barons were at Staines, they split the difference and met halfway. Simple as that. What we have to imagine is a process of shuttle diplomacy. People going backwards and forwards, a bit like the kind of thing that American secretaries of state have to do from time to time. Negotiators going backwards and forwards between the two sides to negotiate a deal. And I think we have to imagine that process going on for 10 days or a fortnight before final agreement was reached on the 15th of June. Barons had come along with their shopping list of demands. They sent them to the king. The king presumably said, oh, goodness, now I cannot possibly consider that. Dream on. Um, so the baronial demands gradually get watered down. Compromises are agreed. In the British Library in London, alongside the two famous originals of Magna Carta, was a document called the Articles of the Barons, which prefigures the final terms of Magna Carta 
quite remarkably. I think we have to imagine that as a nearly last draft, perhaps from the 12th or the 13th of June, perhaps even the day before. It affords us a glimpse into the drafting process. On the baronial side, there were lots of groups who gathered together in the baronial coalition, coming along with their shopping list of grievances, which they wanted redressed. And all of these, one by one, get fed into the Charter. Just to take an example, that famous but seemingly obscure clause about no fish wears on the Thames and the Medway. Why no fish wears on the Thames and the Medway? That was a crucial demand of the Londoners, who used these rivers for the carriage of goods. They wanted the fish wears cleared away to allow free passage on the rivers. You see, I've stressed how important the support of the Londoners was to the barons. On the 15th of June, it's payback time for the barons. Payback comes in that famous clause guaranteeing the liberties of the city, another one still on the statute book today. Payback comes in another respect, in that clause on no fish wears on the Thames and the Medway. What we don't know is whether there was a master mind drafting the Great Charter. Um, was there some sort of Thomas Jefferson figure at work? I rather doubt it. I think it's a bit of a rag bag. Everybody chucking in their two pennyworth. But two men who it is suggested may have been involved in the drafting process were Gervais of Howbridge, Canon Chancellor of St Paul's Cathedral, and Elias de Derham, steward of Archbishop Langton, key figure in the negotiations, and a canon of Salisbury Cathedral. Elias de Derham, I think, is particularly interesting. He was a canon of Salisbury Cathedral. And Salisbury, of course, has one of the four originals of the Charter. Could the Salisbury Charter have been the one which Elias brought back with him from Runnymede to Salisbury? When we talk about Magna Carta in 1215 and we celebrate this great 800th anniversary, we're celebrating a document that existed for just three months. It was drawn up to bring an end to a civil war. And it did that, briefly. One way of looking at Magna Carta, one way is to see it as a great charter of liberties. But what was the purpose of that charter of liberties? The purpose of that charter of liberties was to bring an end to a civil war. And it did that for three months. That's all. In the autumn, war was resumed. Why? Because John went to the Pope to ask him to tear up the Charter, and the Pope obliged. Now, many people ask, why did the Pope tear up Magna Carta? Why did the Pope tear up this document that we regard as the foundation stone of our liberties? The answer's clear. A couple of years before, John, who'd been in dispute with the church, he did not want Langton as Archbishop of Canterbury. John, in the end, gave in. Enemies were crowding in on all sides, and he decided to cut his losses and settle with the church. So the legal position in 1215 was that King John was a faithful son of the church. He'd agreed to go on crusade. And the Pope took all this at face value, saw the barons as constraining the king, and therefore tore the charter up. So that was the end of the 1215 Magna Carta. What happened after that? War was resumed, a very bitter war, and the French intervened on the side of the rebel barons. But then, in October 1216, King John did the best thing that he could have done in the circumstances. He died. And in a sense, that solved the problem at a stroke, because his son and heir was a nine-year-old boy, Henry III, and you can't wage war on an innocent nine-year-old boy. They had a perfect candidate for the regency, waiting in the wings, William Marshall, the great Marshall, the Earl of Pembroke whom everybody respected and trusted. 
So what the marshal did in a masterstroke was take Magna Carta, in origin an opposition document, shred it of all its most controversial clauses, and then reissue it as the new king's gift, peace offering, to his people. Now the trick didn't work the first time, but it did work the second time. So in 1217, peace was restored to England. And interestingly, the draft of the peace treaty was agreed at Kingston-on-Thames, not too far from Runnymede. So when we talk about the influence of Magna Carta over the centuries, we're talking actually about the reissues. The original charter, the 800th anniversary of which we're celebrating this year, had a shelf life of just three months. It was the reissues which were to be the foundation stone of the Constitution. A successful one was 1217, and the final authoritative version of it was launched and accepted in 1225. So we can play this game of Magna Carta anniversaries, you see, for another 10 years. Yes and no. You can see from what I've said that many people did regard the original 1215 version as revolutionary. Yes, I think it was. Um, that's why they had to water it down a bit in the subsequent reissues. So I suppose that's one way of answering the question. Yes, in a sense, it was revolutionary. But the idea of constraining the king which is what the barons were doing in 1215, actually has quite a complex genesis. Um, there was much debate in the 12th and 13th centuries about the relationship between the king and the law. One view was, the view of the royalists obviously, was that the king is above the law. He derives his authority from God. He's answerable only to God and then on the Day of Judgment. So to that background, again, Magna Carta must be judged a revolutionary document. But there was also a view that the king simply discovered and interpreted and published the law. And some theologians, many theologians, I think, would have said the king is always under God's law. And the king is always under natural law. So to the extent that Magna Carta was simply an expression of divine and natural law, you could say, well, it's simply stating what we already know and what the king would anyway be obliged to abide by. So you see, we're actually getting into difficult waters. These are matters over which contemporaries would have differed. But in the immediate circumstances of 1215, if you want a straight answer to a straight question, I would say, yes, it was regarded as quite revolutionary. But it didn't come up out of nowhere. It quickly became, or at least after 1225, it quickly became accepted. And when in Henry III's reign, in about the 1240s or the 1250s, the jurist Henry Bracton wrote a big treatise on the laws of England Bracton said a wonderful phrase, the king in England is below God and below the law. Below God and below the law. And it was Magna Carta that established that. 